Hi guys, today we're going to be talking about, um, so my, my first question before we start the video is that um, President Nixon actually made, I'll stop doing this, President Nixon actually made a phone call in 1969 to the moon, which the moon, according to NASA, is 294,000 miles away. Now, now you, with your own brain, think about this, okay? How do they make that phone call? I mean, did they actually have the technology back then to make that phone call? And was it a landline, landline phone call? So these are the kind of questions I want to ask. I hope you guys enjoy. There were six alleged moon landings between 1969 and 1972, and there's been zero moon landings since. Seems a little suspicious, doesn't it? Well, that's because we never went to the moon. Why would America fake the moon landing? There's a great deal else going on. The Cold War, the space race, the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 62 when the world was going to end. We'll not get into the whole business of nuclear explosions, which can't just take place any old way. They have to be properly targeted, but that's another story. Kennedy was assassinated, the Vietnam War was ramping up. Kennedy was trying to withdraw American troops from Vietnam. President Johnson, within a year of Kennedy's death, had increased their number by 10 times. By the time they withdrew from Vietnam in 1974, 58,000 Americans were dead alongside three million Vietnamese. That is the price we pay in this world for incompetence. The student riots against the Vietnam War, people were literally being killed in the street because they were protesting. It was very, very violent times. Robert Kennedy was assassinated, Martin Luther King was assassinated. America was falling apart. It needed a distraction. Here was the distraction. Land a man on the moon before the decade is out. Wonderful. Kennedy, by this time, was now dead, so we had to fulfill, well, America had to fulfill the president's challenge. America, a very can-do nation, they decide to put their mind to something, they will achieve it. Or if they can't achieve it, they will make it appear that it has been achieved. The U.S. government also faked the moon landing to distract the public from the Vietnam War, which wasn't very popular. It's like if I'm doing something you disapprove of and I can distract you from it, then you don't notice your disapproval of the thing I'm still doing. No dust kicked up on the lunar landing. Take a close look at the lunar module. You'll see there's no dust on the foot pads and it didn't leave a blast crater either. This would be approximately like diving into a swimming pool in your car and not making a splash. Guess what? The moon surface is covered in dust. It's not like landing in a Walmart parking lot covered in pavement. So it would be impossible to land on the moon surface without kicking up a dust storm. Why has nobody been to the moon in such a long time? That's my question. I want to know, but I think I know. Because we didn't go there, and, and that's the way it happened. But the fact remains that there's way more evidence that supports the theory that we never went to the moon than there is to support that we ever did. Now, there are many reasons that prove we never went to the moon. To mention a few, first we have the troposphere. This is where all of our weather occurs and it is the lowest layer of the Earth's atmosphere. It starts at the Earth's surface and extends up to a height of 4 to 10 miles. Next we have the stratosphere which extends to about 35 miles above the Earth's surface. This is where our ozone layer resides and protects us from those dangerous UV rays. It is also the layer where aircraft travels as it is free from weather disturbances. Now we go up to the mesosphere where most meteors burn up on entry. The mesosphere stretches up to 50 miles above the Earth's surface. Next we have the thermosphere and this layer extends up to 400 miles from the Earth's surface and the air here is very thin. Also temperatures here start to get really hot ranging anywhere from 200 to 500 degrees Celsius and 500 to 2000 degrees Celsius in the upper region. And last but not least is the exosphere. The temperature in the exosphere can vary from 0 to 1700 degrees Celsius. The exosphere is the outermost layer of the Earth's atmosphere and is around 6,200 miles from the Earth's surface. As we get further away from Earth, 
we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Hang on, hang on. So what you're saying is that in order to send humans through this region, we need to solve the challenge of getting through the Van Allen radiation belts. Uh, but I'm confused. Didn't you already solve this challenge back in 1969 when you sent astronauts to the moon and subsequently five other times after that? Here we have another astronaut that wasn't told about the moon landing 48 years ago. Uh, the plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is, that is much bigger than what we have today. And it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, be, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. We only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. And we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. So how is it that we had the technology to achieve this amazing feat back in 1969, but we're still working on the technology in 2017, almost half a century later? Well, I managed to find a very clever and well-informed astronaut that will totally straighten things out for us and explain exactly why we're not able to return to the moon uh, and break through those Van Allen radiation belts. Have a listen to this clever chat. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. This guy, oh boy. He's a real life example of what can happen to you when you're exposed to all of that outer space radiation. And if you're a child with aspirations of becoming an astronaut, being a very good liar might be a positive attribute to have on your resume. Whether you know it's fake or real, I mean, what is that going to do? What are we going to do with that information exactly? You tell, when you try to tell somebody who's asleep about these informations, they call you crazy. And I am one of those guys that was called crazy because I told people about the stuff that I know and you know, it is what it is, I guess. And I've kind of gotten used to being called crazy, so it's whatever. But at the end of the day, you have to really think for yourself. And are you really thinking for yourself? Or do you have big pharma companies thinking for you? I mean, just think about that for a sec. Let's continue the video, and I'll probably see you guys at the end now, okay? We are looking at a phenomenon now called colored banding. And I've taken this all from Apollo 16 footage. You can see that every time something goes by, the camera lens quickly, with any pace to it, gets this colored banding on it. And that goes for shadows as well. And I'm going to slow it down here so you can see when the shadow is created, the color banding happens. And that's a freeze frame of the color banding around the shadow. This is station two. Apollo 16, and just get a perspective for how far the astronaut on the right is. And the camera we're watching this through is the color TV camera on the rover, which is controlled from Houston. And note the light source in the visor of the astronaut walking by. And now, we're going to cut a little further in this clip. Pay attention to what happens. Just a very pressy side as far as the boulder goes. They're all angular. Just a very pressy side as far as the boulder goes. They're all angular. What you're looking at are shadows covering the entire location out to the horizon. I'm showing you the same clip. And there are two shadows. One, two. That is impossible with the sun as the light source. The only way this could be possible is if it's an artificial light source because there's nothing tall enough there to block out that much space. And I showed you how far the astronaut is from the rover. And 
these shadows are covering the entire location. And this is black and white normal speed. See his backpack, light, shadow. Okay, now let's take one black and white, slow down. Also note that the image is shaking because the other astronaut is at the rover. It's as if something has fallen across the light source, causing fast moving shadows. The banding reads on the back of the astronaut's backpack, but it doesn't read in the black zone because the lens only puts banding on things it can read, and it can't read a shadow in the darkness. If the light source is the sun, how do you block out the sun with two guys on the moon? And it's going at about the same pace. It shows no sign of the momentum slowing down. It's just going back and forth as if some sort of vent is blowing on it. But there's nothing that can be blowing on it if that's the moon. Because on the moon there is no atmosphere, there's no wind, there's no air, there's no breeze that can be blowing that. And we're going to see the same phenomenon with the equipment transfer bag. As soon as astronaut Charlie Duke attaches it to the Mesa table, it starts swinging on its own again, as if it was being installed right over a vent. But then it gets really interesting because I think they notice it and they discuss it and then take corrective actions. Hey John? Yeah? Take a look. No. Okay, uh, Charlie, you should have... Uh... Now you're going to see Charlie Duke take corrective action. He's going to walk over to the swinging ETB bag. He's going to remove the camera that's attached to his chest. He's going to put it on top of the Mesa table. And then he's going to put his camera in the ETB bag. And then he's going to remove the bag from the straps. And he's going to place it on top of the Mesa table so it's no longer swinging from the straps. And there's obviously a voice we can't hear organizing the charade-like diversion you are about to see. Where's the uh, bag that, uh, that the, uh, the good old uh, UV? Hey, Charlie, did you throw my camera away? No, I didn't throw your camera away. Where is it? Over there? Yeah. Okay. <sighs> the bag that the what? The bag that the what? He's obviously hearing a voice we can't hear who's telling him what to do. This is just a really strange scene. Now watch as he walks away. You'll see he no longer has the camera. You can't have any wind or breeze of ventilation on the moon. But this thing is like a perpetual motion machine. And this is how they corrected that motion, by taking it off the straps and putting it on top of the table. Okay, now let's go back to the first clip from EVA-1 again, and you see the bag swinging on the right. I'm revisiting this, not so much to look at the bag, but that strap in the right hand corner that hangs down from the ship. Keep your eyes on that strap because it's about to get hit by an object. What are we gonna do with this thing? Can we throw it away? Uh, leave it on it, just throw it away, it's empty. Pull it straight up, there you go. That crummy thing. Fail. Hell, that's okay. Yeah.
was hit with momentum, but it exhausts the momentum and it slows down and it practically comes to a complete pause. And that's the reason I'm showing you this, to illustrate the fact that you can see momentum acting naturally in this clip. Let's take another look at it. But notice how that strap responds to gravity and responds to the momentum dissipating, whereas the ETB bag does not. It goes at a steady pace throughout both clips from EVA1 and EVA3. All of the damaged photographs were taken with number 39. 162 photos on magazine 116E, and there are some other damaged photographs with this exact same pattern on magazine 114B. So you've been looking at the cover of the Apollo 16 technical debrief document, and I want to draw your attention to the commentary on this issue. Quote, the cameras worked nominally, even though we got them real dusty, and it was hard to see the setting after the EVAs. We wiped them down with a wet cloth inside and changed the film outside. Not only that, I guess according to the photo guys, we got some dust inside on the residue. The camera still worked, although it left a couple or three streaks across the film. Notice what John Young says about the photo guys. This raises an important point. We'll digress for a second to discuss one of the main defenses that people make to show or argue that we had to have gone to the moon. And they often say that there would have been so many people involved in the conspiracy it would have been impossible to keep it quiet. The only people who would have known about the hoax would have been those on a need-to-know basis, and that would have been very few people. You have your astronauts, you have the people filming everything and building the locations, and you have the people authorizing it, and that's it. Everybody else would have been doing their one task in the line and sequence of events that they were responsible for. back to what John Young said by way of illustration about the photo guys, the photo guys would have received the film. The film couldn't be developed on the moon. It had a chain of custody that had to take place and those guys were not in on it. Now this is the cover of Apollo 16 mission report and let's go to the equipment section. Paragraph D, the residue plate on the Lunar Module Pilot's 70 millimeter electric data camera was smeared during a magazine change between extravehicular activities two and three. Charlie Duke indicates that they wiped the residue plates down with a wet cloth inside the cabin in between the EVAs. When they were done with their work on the moon, they would go back into the Lunar Module, seal the hatch, repressurize the cabin, camp out for the night until the next day when they would continue the mission on the second EVA and then the third EVA. Now let's take a look at the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal and they are taking their cue from the debrief and from the mission report. In the brackets their explanation states each frame on magazine 116E shows a set of smudges. Detail of the smudge pattern change only slowly from the beginning of the magazine to the end. The smudges are undoubtedly the result of contact of a dust-laden, damp cloth with the Rezao plate in John's camera. So NASA, the astronauts, and the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal all march in lockstep alleging that the stain happened inside the cabin in between EVA 2 and 3. This is because the surface of the moon is a near vacuum and all moisture and liquid would boil immediately in the vacuum of space. And indeed, this entire story is a complete fiction. It's a fraud and it's a lie and NASA knows absolutely with 100% certainty exactly when that smudging happened and it did not happen 
in between EVA2 and EVA3 inside the cabin of the lunar module. It did not happen then. Furthermore, the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal is absolutely wrong in its assertion that this smudging happened as the result of contact with a damp, dust-laden cloth. And what you see is the familiar splash pattern of a spill. Something was spilled on the camera. This is a picture of the index for Apollo 16 from the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal at nasa.gov. And when you come to Geology Station 8, you'll see below that Traverse to Station 9. And instead of Geology Station 9, it says the Great Sneak. And when you click the Great Sneak, it brings you to Geology Station 9. And this is where the magazine change happens And here are the final three shots taken with 107C directly at Station 9 during EVA 2. And these are not marked by the smudges. Concluding that magazine at Station 9, none of them are marked by the smudges. They are absolutely perfect. Which one, Charlie? Delta for me and Bravo for you. Bravo. Right in the corner there. Dark. The image you are looking at now was the very last picture taken before that magazine change at Station 9 where they are now. This is 107-17583 and as you can see there are no smudges on it. The very next picture taken with that camera is after the swap of magazines and this is now 114-18444. And that photo was on magazine 114B. On the left, we have 18444, the very first image taken with the smudges. And you can see the pattern is clear. The dust has not grabbed to it yet. On the right is 18577. And this one was taken the next day during EVA 3. Compare the two stains. The streaks are the same. These are the same exact patterns. The orange juice dried and it's stained in the same way. The streaks match. See the first long streak on the left, and then look to the right image, and that same long streak is there, and it becomes obvious that this is a spill pattern of orange juice spilled on the glass that persisted over two days. Every single photograph taken with camera 39 up until this moment at station nine during EVA two was absolutely perfect, and every single photograph taken with that camera from this moment on will be absolutely smudged. If the astronauts had wiped the cameras down with a damp cloth inside the cabin later that evening, we would not see the stain pattern the next day during EVA 3. And this is the moment that it happens. John Young drops his sample bags and Charlie Duke comes over to help him reattach them to his camera and John Young asks Charlie Duke to check his lens and since we know that the very next picture snapped with that camera will have the familiar stain pattern on it, John Young's concern with his lens leads us to another possibility that the stain pattern is on the lens and not the res out plate.
So what has just happened to cause this stain pattern to emerge? The answer is orange juice. It has been well documented that the astronauts had a problem with the suction straws inside their helmets that allowed them to take sips of orange juice. The straws would accidentally squirt orange juice all over them and into their helmets and this was a big problem on the mission and the orange juice actually seeped into the neck ring and it appears obvious now that the orange juice leaked through the neck ring at station 9 and caused the camera to be stained and that is direct evidence that they could not possibly be on the moon because if orange juice could leak through the helmet lock then the helmet lock was not properly sealed to protect the astronauts from the vacuum of space and this is because the helmet and the neck ring in order to be airtight, must also have been watertight because water molecules are bigger than air molecules. So if water escaped, then oxygen also escaped and the suit would not have been pressurized and in that case, the astronauts would be dead. Okay, so you guys made it to the end. Uh, thank you, first of all. <laughs> it was a long video, I know. And second thing is, what do you guys think? Is it, do you think it's really staged? Do you think it was done in Hollywood? Do you think it was done in, in Nevada maybe? In the deserts, you know? Um, I don't know, you tell me what you guys think and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Okay guys, that was our video. What did you think? Let us know. Don't forget to share the video and subscribe. Thanks for watching we got more great content coming up soon. See you in the next video.